Thanks for joining us for our inaugural IT Pro Live event. Today we've heard from a long list of great speakers. We'll close out day one speakers with Douglas Squirrel and Jeffrey Frederick on the suddenly virtual corporate world we're living in today and using agile development techniques as part of our general business conversations and leadership approaches. I now present Douglas Squirrel, the director of Squirrel Squared, and Jeffrey Frederick, the managing director of TIM. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having us. Hi there. Thanks. I think we should probably say who we are a little bit more because uh, people probably haven't heard of either Squirrel Squared or Tim. Do you want to go first, Jeffrey? Sure. Well, of course, you're, you're leaving out all of our podcast listeners. Uh, so well, I'm uh, Jeffrey Frederick. Uh, I'm managing director of a fin financial technology company in London called Tim. Uh, and I've been a longtime agile practitioner, uh, also uh, executive coach. And uh, along with uh, Douglas Squirrel, uh, co-host of the Troubleshooting Agile podcast. Absolutely. And I'm Squirrel. That's what most people call me, but you can also call me Douglas. And I am an independent consultant. That means I work with all kinds of different companies, something like 82 in the last five years. And before that, I was a CTO at a series of different startups. So I've been in the CTO game for something like 20 years and uh, tried to apply as many good techniques as I can, which is what we're going to talk to you about today. All right. And so if we go ahead and move to our slides. That would be great. All right. Look All right. At that. Uh, so uh, we're talking today about something about uh, building trust and the suddenly virtual uh, enterprise. Let's, before we get into this, like, why talk about trust uh, and and uh, uh, tell us a bit about why that would be the important point before we get started. Sure. Well, uh, one of the most difficult things I was just having uh, somebody talk to me about this this morning is how hard it is and how how um, how much it throws into relief the fact that we're all at home. So here I am in my uh, beautiful shed in Folkestone with the sheep next door, and I'm trying to talk to as many different people as I can and my, all, my, all my clients. And it feels like I'm just forcing everything through this tiny screen. And uh, it's so much more difficult to get all the um, informal cues that you naturally get in person. But that means trust is that much more important. And that's what the person was struggling with this morning. He was trying to figure out, how can I build trust? How can I have trust in the, the people in my team when I can't even see them? I can't even take them to the pub. He said, look, you know, if I could just deal with this person, I could just take him down the pub for three pints. It's somehow three pints was really important to him. If I could just take him down by the third pint, we'd be all sorted. And um, I, I'm not sure what to do about that. So we worked through some of the techniques and ideas that we're going to uh, talk about today for building trust that works surprisingly well in uh, the situation we all find ourselves in. Right. That's, that's great. I think hopefully people will uh, can identify that. I know I could really go for three points right about now. Um, what we're going to be talking about today are uh, items that have come from our book that was recently published uh, and in um, just May by T Revolution called Agile Conversations. And the subtitle it pretty much, I think, is what's really relevant for people today on this track, uh, which is if you want to transform your culture, you do that by transforming your conversations. But to start off, yeah, if you want uh, to hear lots more about that, we're, it's on conversationaltransformation.com. So lots more um, that you can read beyond what we're doing here today. That's right. Um, and, th and this idea that uh, transforming and and uh, culture is something that it's not just us who put this together. I think it's pretty common that people say, if we're doing a transformation, then we're going to have to change our culture. That That's something I hear all the time. Absolutely. And uh, the, the problem is people can say, yes, we need to change our culture. We need to have people uh, start collaborating across silos. We're looking to um, make a more nimble organization where there's a lot more collaboration. Um, and so everyone says, like, this is what it should be like. They can say, this is how we want our culture to look. But it turns out, when people get this advice, they're really not given much as far as uh, how we'd go about doing it. So, uh, oh, Jeffrey, I, I think people get, 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 get loads of advice. They, they get a book <laughs> and usually some training, and they turn in the book to you know page 472, and it says how to hold their retrospective and, and, and exactly how long their stand-up should be. That, that sounds great. It tells yeah. them exactly what to do. <laughs> well, it, they, they, they get that kind of thing if they're in a the certain kind of culture. And I think this is what uh, you and I, Squirrel, both agree is going to be a problem is that when people go about looking to make a transformation, they, they're saying we want to have a digital transformation or a DevOps transformation or an agile conversation transformation or a lean transformation. And we want to have a different culture. But the way that they approach 
their transformation tends to, to match the culture they already have, not the culture that when they want to uh, get to. What you were just describing is something we hear all the time, uh, which is, yep, follow the best practice there on page 432, but that really is reflective of a bureaucratic culture. Uh, that's easy to do because it's visible. Like we have artifacts we can see. So it's, I think it's pretty common for me that when I come across a company that's doing a transformation, that bureaucratic is one of the types that I tend to see. But it's not that uncommon to see the others, and you can guess which one uh, what one might prefer by the order that we've put them in. Um, that the um, pathological doesn't sound like that's what you want to be, and generative sounds like <laughs> that's where you want to be. So pathological would be the very top-down directed uh, approach, which can work very efficiently, just doesn't bring anybody else along. Generative is uh, one where the, the whole organization is working together well. That's where people generally want to be. But if they start, much more typically in a pathological or bureaucratic organization, they're going to have a lot of trouble getting to a generative one. And reading a book is not enough. Having an agile coach is not enough. Right. And there's knowing the ceremonies is not enough. And the thing for me is I often see these things combined. So it'd be a case where there's someone at the top uh, who says, you know, we're going to go ahead and, and we're making this change uh, starting, you know, Monday. We're, we're a digital first organization. And, and by God, that's the way it's going to be. And they push that down that agenda without getting buy-in. And then people in, in the mid-tier mid pick it up in sort of a bureaucratic approach. Like, okay, well, how can we say that we've done the right things? We'll go ahead and, and uh, bring in the right ceremonies and have a checklist to make sure we're doing all the checks. Yep, yep, yep. Unfortunately, this is not a situation where one plus two equals three, right? Pathological plus bureaucratic doesn't get you to generative. Now, when we have people who are making these transformations, it's, it's not just us who'd say like, okay, if you're going to make your transformation, you need to have trust as a foundation. Uh, this is a very uh, popular book out there called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, uh, and it has a very nice model for what it takes to have a high-performing team. And in particular, what are the, the problems when you're missing these elements, uh, how things go wrong? And the absence of trust is the very first hurdle that so many people fall over. But again, knowing that this is what you want to have, knowing that you want to have trust and that absence of a trusted problem doesn't exactly tell you what to do. And, and, and Scroll, you, you didn't find that book to be very helpful on this point. No, I'm, I'm not happy. I'm, I, I guess we have to include this slide, but I'd, I'd sure um, like to get my hands on Mr. Lencioni because I'm, I'm really not happy with him. When I got the book, I read it and I thought, wow, this is an amazing story of these amazing people and their huge transformation and all the things they changed. And I wonder how they did it good, there's a section in the back that will tell me what I should do. And I turned to it with excitement and I got there and it told me that in order to build trust, we should go on a ropes course and we should tell stories about our history. And I said, I've never seen that work. I don't believe it. I threw the book across the room. I was really, really frustrated. So uh, I, I hope I get to meet Lencioni someday and, and hold him to account for um, letting us down. But it's actually not only his fault. I'm being a little unfair to him because most books like this, they don't tell you what you should actually do. They just say, you should have trust. You should have a generative culture. You should have accountability and commitment. Yeah, thank you. How the heck do I do that? <laughs> That's right. They, so they, they give you practices to do. They give you things to do, but not things that build trust. They say, you know, have trust and do these things. Uh, and one of those is easy, right? You can do the things. You can have the checklist. Are we doing stand-ups? Are we, you know, having the right rituals? But do you have the trust to make them work? That's another problem. Now, to, to be and the fair, problem is that sometimes going on a ropes course will work, right? So sometimes you go on a ropes course and you build trust because you fall off the rope and somebody catches you and you say, wow, I really trust this person <laughs> now. So, so getting lucky is, is always an option. But Jeffrey, I, I don't yes. think that uh, our listeners really want to, uh, to, to get lucky. That, that doesn't seem like a business strategy to me. Well, well actually, they, they actually would like to get lucky. I, I always well, recommend sure. it. Because if you have a way to get lucky, be lucky first. But, if they, but I wouldn't make that your, your go-to strategy. <laughs> you, you better have a fallback. Now, now, we're talking about trust here and, and how we can build trust. And the point that we're going to make today is that there are ways to build trust. And there are skills that you can learn and that we will teach you the beginning skills of how you can begin building trust. But before we get there, we might say like a little bit, we're going to say a little bit about why trust is not the default. Why does it take some sort of actions, some sort of special effort to build trust? Why isn't trust innate when everyone wants to have trust? And uh, what we have here is a tool from the discipline we'll be talking about today, which is uh, something called action science. 
and action science is about how organizations learn, how they make effective decisions together. And one of the models that they have is this diagram called the ladder of inference. And there's lots of different pictures of ladders out there. If you Google ladder of inference, you'll come up with lots of different ones. But this one's my favorite. <clears throat> and there's two elements that I really like. The first is uh, that you have this ladder and that you can see that there's some part of the ladder that's outside of someone's head. And then there's uh, a bunch that happens in my head. <clears throat> and then again, I take actions outside of my head. There's things that I do in the real world. So there's a real world and there's the stuff in my head and they are different. And it's really important uh, that, that we understand the difference between those two because we don't always, we're not always aware of the differences, the gaps. In fact, that's a, a well-known cognitive bias known as naive realism where we basically feel like what we see and the conclusions we draw are facts in the world. And what we see is this objective truth as opposed to conclusions that we've drawn. So that's a real problem. The, the second thing I like about this diagram is this reflexive loop. And it makes the point that the things that we believe changes what we take in from the world. So if we have a bunch of us on a team uh, and, and we're sitting around a desk, we have different beliefs about the world. So we might all hear the same presentation. We might have the same client talking to us about their needs, but we will hear different things. We will, we will essentially select different data, which will lead us to different meanings, assumptions, conclusions, and beliefs. And we will be unaware of it. And uh, by the other hand, again, we have this cognitive biases, the way our minds work, where we have a, where essentially our cognition is made of cognitive biases. And one of them is the illusion of transparency, which is we often believe not only that is what we uh, see in the world obvious, but that uh, what we're believing, what we're thinking is apparent to other people, that they can tell what we really mean. And, and in fact, that's bi-directional. We often think that we understand other people's mental states a much greater sense than we do. So we end up not being curious. We don't ask people what they think because we think we know from this illusion of transparency. Now, we and, put all this together. And this together. is even trickier when you're trying to have a, a virtual pint, right? So if you're, <laughs> if you're trying to interact with somebody through a little screen, you know, I just talked over Jeffrey there. So I might conclude, well, Jeffrey knows that I had something important to say here. And he knows I always say that at this point. So, so he'll understand. <laughs> he might actually be really angry with me but I would not have a way of knowing that. And similarly, I might, uh, uh, I might think, well, he knows that I'm feeling that this is an important point that I'm making that I've interrupted for. And um, uh, he might not have any idea that that's what I think. He might just think I'm being rude and obnoxious. <laughs> so Jeffrey's welcome to share with uh, me and the group if that's the case. Yeah, I was, that was not thinking that you were obnoxious. Thank you for asking, but that was, was not the case. It, that's it, good. But it is but a it's, good it's harder for us to tell. There's many fewer signals in this mode. That's right. When, and you and I, Squirrel, we've, we've given uh, lots of talks together, and it's quite normal for us to, to talk back and forth. Uh, and it is that sort of uh, the problem of, of uh, uh, being virtual that makes us a bit trickier. Uh, because we have trust, we can work through it. And when we, if you have people who lack trust, though, that's where you're likely to get off on these uh, um, uh, unhelpful assumptions. And that's what is, what is actually, so this leads a very nice lead into our next slide, which is the problem is we, we have these private ladders that we think are sure of the world. We have these cognitive biases that lead us to make some really trust damaging assumptions. And now Squirrel, you'll say something brilliant and fantastic about the material on the slide. That's great. If I can see it, I can't see all of it, but I'll, I'll talk about the bits that I can see. Um, so uh, what people tend to believe, and I'll, I'll see this, the, mo the most common uh, symptom of this is when people um, come along and they say, well, Squirrel, you know, it's great what you're talking about. We really need to help those other people over there um, work better on their conversations because, you know, they just don't agree with me. And if I could just convince <laughs> them, I mean, Squirrel, if you just had something that could help me convince them of what's obvious, I mean, it's obvious to all of us what the right thing to do is we need to get this digital transformation under way because we're going to get killed by the market unless we uh, uh, get an app out the door. But these guys, they just, uh, they just don't get it. And what that philosophy, what that thinking uh, is coming from is this kind of um, unproductive reasoning that, uh, that, uh, that this path, right? they have pure motives, their beliefs are justified, and they are not part of the problem. So that's the tough news we have for you today. So if you if you leave here feeling a bit bad, then we accomplished our goal. <laughs> because you should feel that if your digital transformation is not going as it should, that you are part of the problem. And that's wonderful news, in fact. 
because you probably make some of these trust damaging assumptions that are harming your attempt to get to a generative culture that would make your transformation much more successful. And that means you can do something about it. Rather than trying to get someone to come in and fix some other people, you today could do something different that could change this. So we're going to show you some of those things that you can do. And there's lots more uh, in our book and elsewhere. So there are things you can do about it. The bad news is it's probably your fault. <laughs> And and I, I really like your point there, which is that we should take that as good news. Uh, that that does mean that there's something you can do about it. Now we've we've made the point here that that being virtual makes this harder. Humans are communicating beings. It is in our nature to communicate. And it, I really like the story that you let in with, which I had no idea was coming because it was what happened today. Uh, about if we can take people down the pipe, people are used to trying to work things out with each other, and the the thing is that we are so hardwired for face-to-face -face conversations uh, that anything less uh, really starts to damage our ability to communicate. Uh, and the reason is because we have unconscious techniques for communication that we trust. We look at each other's uh, gestures. We look at their, uh, their body language. We, we listen to tone of voice, the small inflections, pauses, uh, things that uh, really get degraded over video conferencing. So when we say that the the, uh, the virtual makes things harder, in part it makes things harder because all of the things we rely on normally to build uh, a relationship, to build communications with, they, they go away. And so we're, we're no longer, our instincts don't no longer work for us, they start to work against us. So we already, we, even in, in physical space, these kind of conflicts uh, that we we're describing, the problems of uh, the cognitive biases and how it lead to unhelpful assumptions, those things still exist even when you're face to face. And then when you go ahead and add in the virtual element, well, then it's no surprise that we end up with what we would call dueling ladders. People who have made, come to their own conclusions and are sitting there saying things back and forth with each other, but they're, they're not sharing, they're not curious, they're not transparent. Uh, and, uh, and they're unaware of how they're contributing to the problem. And you often see this on chat shows, for example. So you'll see somebody who gets on the chat show and they say, we should open the borders. Immigration is great. We should have lots more people come. Our country is open for business. And there's somebody else who's, and that's acting at the top of the ladder. That's an action that that person wants you to take. And there's somebody else says, we should close the borders. Immigration is bad. We should not have any of it. What never happens is somebody going down the ladder and saying, boy, that sounds really interesting. How did you come to that conclusion? You know, what uh, what did you see? What did you hear? What does it mean for you? What are the assumptions? You know what, actually, I, I think you might be right. Can I join your party? That never happens on the chat show. So we don't have this kind of model in front of us of uh, a conversation that is not a dueling ladder. But in fact, it's a very productive one. It's the kind that you really, really need when you want to get your team to uh, get moving toward a digital transformation, for example. I, I will butt in with one other thing, though. I, I, I did want to, I did just want to mention something in favor of being virtual. There's some, there's a saving grace. There's a silver lining, and the silver lining is that if you're on email, if you're on Slack, if you have something that is written that you're communicating with, so it's even less than a video call. It's just you're communicating purely in writing. That does have the advantage that you can reflect on it a little bit. You can think about what you're going to say. You can go back and reflect afterwards. Oh man, I shouldn't have written that. Boy, that wasn't useful. And you'll see, we'll talk more about how you can do that in a structured way. So there's something good about the virtual situation. It's only a silver lining, but there, there is something helpful that it's not ephemeral in the way that uh, an in-person conversation or a video call is. Uh, that's a great another way to say look there there is a way for you to learn here although as as uh, we were saying before it really it requires the idea that you have something to learn usually the challenge that people have in improving their conversations is the idea that they um, already believe their communication is pretty good and and so we end up with this and it's, the reason is because is there's this paradox everyone already knows uh, what it takes to get good decisions uh, in fact, people will talk about what good teamwork looks like. Again, this is the, the books tell you what good looks like. And so if you said, yep, we have a very diverse team and diversity is a strength because we have different people with different backgrounds. They bring different information and that allows us to have a lot of back and forth between ideas. Everyone go, yeah, that's great. That's exactly what you want. The idea that diversity is strength is something that people generally accept, but something changes when we there's a decision that we actually care about w what happens scroll when we suddenly like when we say yep this this one really matters that's how i normally am but this this time is different
this is special exception exactly so um what happens is that people switch into that defensive mode that i was referring to before where they're thinking about how they can well just this one time it's really clear because i understand the situation better than other people we don't really need a lot of debate boy we could wind up in a debate for days and we'd try to achieve consensus it's ridiculous so it doesn't make any sense there's the obvious path to go down we're going to go down this path and then the next time when it doesn't matter quite so much then we'll uh, do the diversity and, and sharing ideas thing but right now look come on we we just want to understand how we can get to where we're going understanding other ideas not that important and that's what i hear over and over again especially when people want to convince other people i usually try to outlaw the word convince in my uh, conversations and in my coaching right and the the problem though is people are, are unaware of it because when they think about how about themselves and about how they would collaborate they think about the way they think good collaboration is they're, they don't think about their own behavior. It's sort of like someone I was talking about who was saying that they only had cookies on special occasions. And, and I mm -hmm. said, oh, really, like, like what? And it sort of came down to uh, when cookies are available. When there are cookies. cookies are available. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's a special, special. occasion. And, if you could see all of me, way. you could see that I, I, need, I need this lesson about uh, not having cookies <laughs> quite all the time. So I'm, I'm working on that. I don't have any cookies. I have no special occasions. But that's got, uh, that, that doesn't work as well in conversations. It's uh, you know, usually yep. much more difficult. That's right. So the default is that people say, yep, I'm, I'm great at this collaborative conversation stuff, unless there's an important decision to make. <laughs> but the, again, the, the good news, and now we're going to get into how we actually do it, is that you actually can change your culture. You, you can learn the conversation things we're going to talk about. And uh, there's, it, there's a lot of research that shows that these things build trust, build relationships, and, and change the culture and get much better outcomes. And the good news is and the that, good news also you is are, that you, you well, sorry, you go ahead, Jeffrey, like. keep going. Sorry, I thought. <laughs> well, say, you know what it go looks ahead. like. Scroll, you and I, we ask people uh, all the time, we'd say like, okay, we're going to make a decision. You know, you and I and everyone uh, out there uh, on the uh, who's, who's watching the, this uh, conference, if suddenly all of you were in the room, we're all in the same room together, and we're going to make a decision of what the agenda is going to be like for the next IT Pro Live, uh, we could ask anyone in there uh, uh, the question we always ask: what, What's that question, and what would they say? Well, the question is: um, How would you go about making the decision? How would you get the best result? And the answer they always give absolutely uniformly. Sometimes I'll even do it uh, with telepathy. I'll say, I know the answer and it's on the next slide. <laughs> um, because the answer they always give is, well, I'd ask everybody for their opinion and I'd make sure that I heard what their thoughts were and I'd share what I know about the situation. And then after a discussion, we'd come to a conclusion that worked for all of us. That's what everybody says. The problem is we don't do it when it matters. And that's the challenge. That's right. And uh, so the, what we're going to do is now is take you the process of where you can begin learning from your conversations. And so you're going to be in the good news about this, by the way. Sorry, Jeffrey, I keep talking over you. I think we're just a little delayed. I apologize. Can I butt in for just a second? Would that be okay? Please, please do. Awesome. So the, the good news that I just want to share here is this is something you can test. So, and it's something you can test by actually doing the, the, the things that we're going to show you. And you will find out very quickly whether it actually makes a difference for you. It's called action science for a reason, because you can do experiments. And so you can go and try this and see if it does, in fact, build trust, help you with your conversations, help you be less defensive. If that works, great, let us know. And if it doesn't work, we'd also be really interested because we haven't found very many cases where it doesn't work, but we'd, be, we'd sure like to know about it. So unlike things like go on a ropes course and you will suddenly be more trustful, that's harder to test. You have to get ropes and you have to um, actually measure <laughs> how, much how much trust you have afterwards. That's quite difficult. You can analyze a conversation the way we're going to show you and discover whether it works for you or not. If it doesn't, we'd like to hear about it. All right. So we're going to talk here about how to do conversational analysis. And we're going to give you a generic template. And the idea is that with this outline, you can then use different tools. And we're going to show you how to use a couple different tools in this presentation. And we'll start with the basic one. But first, the overview of the four R's. And they are, number one, four. record. Uh, number two, reflect. Uh, number three, revise. Of course, then you have to repeat uh, until you get something you like. And then four, role play. And then that naturally leads to a role reversal. And so there you go. The six, four, the R's. Six, four R's. Something went wrong there in our <laughs> maths, but that's okay. We'll explain what those all, uh, so those all work. We'll, we'll just step you through this. 
Uh, first, uh, Squirrel, can you describe how how is we record? What what do we do to record a conversation? Yep. And this is extremely important that you have the correct equipment. So um, one of the things that is important about this uh, this technique is it requires some some equipment. And uh, we have the equipment here on the screen. Actually, I don't think I have the other piece of equipment that you need. Yeah, it's a pen. So you need a pen and a piece of paper, and, and you need a particular skill, which I'm going to teach all of you now, and that is to take the piece of paper and to fold it in half. So those are all the skills and equipment that you need. Um, this is uh, clearly a, a road to riches for us with um, uh, highly paid consulting uh, opportunities, boxes of materials consisting of paper and pen. Um, so uh, that's all you need. And what you do mechanically is after you've got your two columns, you write down what each person said in the conversations on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, you write down what uh, you thought and felt during the conversation. If you happen to be a telepath, you can write what the other person thought and felt. But unfortunately, I doubt very many of you are telepaths. So you're going to have to write only what you thought and felt. And you'll see why that's important as we move through the, the process. And uh, a couple other things to note are, uh, first of all, a lot of people say, well, I had a long conversation. Do I have to write everything down? No. Usually starting with a single sheet of paper is enough. And you can concentrate on, you kind of know where the tough bit was. You kind of know where it went off the rails. And you say, oh, yeah, that was the part where my heart started to race and my so I'm, uh, stomach went through my shoes. And yeah, that was the part. And you write down that part. And then people say, well, you know, I don't have a recording of it. I don't remember it very well. It was two weeks ago. I don't remember what we said. That's OK. You write down the sense of it. If it was a difficult conversation, it was one that eroded trust. If it was one that led to a, a rift that's uh, holding up your digital conversation, your transformation, you'll know enough to be able to write down the important bits, and you'll start to learn tons from writing down what you remember. We, when we had a, a reader just contact us recently that said they were doing a conversation analysis, and they said even at this point, even just doing the recording, they had some aha moments. They're like, "Oh my gosh, uh, I, I realized now some mistakes I made." And it's very interesting because the other thing that people ask us is they say, do I actually need to write it down? Can't I just do this in yes. my head? <laughs> and we can say, no cheating. It must be written down. You can't do this in the head. And, and the reason is, remember before we were talking about cognitive biases, those cognitive biases are a function of how your brain works. As long as you have the dialogue in your head, you are heavily subject to those cognitive biases. When you go in- It's going out of your head and back into your head. Yeah, it looks like yeah. the same. It's the same person. You can't think about yourself, but that's right. When you think about someone so, else, when you yeah, when you get on the paper, suddenly you're someone else. You have this process called self distancing, and and uh, not now social distancing, you can go ahead. self distancing. <laughs> and so when you have the self distancing, now you can start looking at the dialogue as though we're for someone else. And it turns out we're much better at finding mistakes that other people make than our own. And that includes our, the, that other person on the paper, even if you were the person who originally spoke those words. So when you write this down, you become essentially those words become like from someone else and you can begin investigating it. I said the analogy, it's like you can't have a telescope examine the telescope, but you can have the, the, the or a microscope, but you can't have a microscope look at a picture of that microscope. So that's kind of what we're doing here. The, 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 the paper is your, your picture and then you're gonna, when you analyze it, you're able to, to essentially look inside your head better than you can when everything's in your head. And this uh, is also uh, where- A good friend of ours um, uh, who taught us a lot of these ideas and worked with us on them, uh, used to go off to conferences and, and events. He was a consultant. And so he would record his um, conversations with the, his clients at these uh, activities. And he'd go back to his hotel room and play the, the tape recording. It was long ago. And people still use tape recorders and he'd press play and he'd listen to it. And then his name was Benjamin. And he would shout at the tape recorder, Benjamin, don't do that. I've told you not to do that. That's not right. <laughs> And of course, he was Benjamin. He was shouting at himself on the tape recorder, but it was because he could distance enough from himself that he was able to see himself as, for the moment, a different Benjamin who was screwing up. And so it was then very yeah. evident to him what he could do differently. Yes. Uh, and this is also that the record step is where you were saying you have some of the advantages of being virtual. So sometimes maybe the things you had to do in a chat room or something or an email, now you have your record ready to go. Or maybe you have a recording of a Zoom meeting. You can go back and find uh, what you had. You have that record to take forward. So the, the recording will always be in kind of the same form, no matter what tool you're using. But what changes now is the next step when you start to reflect. And we're going to start with one type of reflection, which is just the very fundamentals, which is that uh, curiosity and transparency. 
Can you walk us through uh, on this example? Uh, what is this example we're looking at and how would we use this? Uh, how would we reflect on this for curiosity, transparency, and triggers? Sure. So um, uh, this is an example you can read for yourselves. Um, and I think we're going to make these slides available afterwards so you can come back and read it in, in, in more, with more care. Um, this is a, a, an example straight from the book. Um, so rather than go through each bit of it, what I'll just say is uh, if you take a quick scan down the left hand side, you'll see that Norbert, the, the sysadmin who's uh, in the middle of a transformation trying to, to make some changes, um, certainly doesn't have a very positive opinion. Um, you're, he calls the other person a hypocrite, um, uh, says there's no point arguing against your decision. This is the sort of thing that happens when you don't have trust uh, with the other person. Um, but that's evident in his left hand column. It's evident in what he's thinking and feeling to himself. The problem is due to those cognitive biases, he may think Quinn, the other person, uh, knows about these things. That person has no idea. If you read the right-hand side, you can see this might look like a much less difficult conversation. So uh, what uh, Norbert, the person having the conversation who's written this uh, conversational analysis, can do is to look for uh, signals that he's been curious, transparent, and uh, that he's um, uh, identified what things might trigger him. So uh, uh, what he could do is go through the right-hand side and circle the question marks. So if you look down quickly, you'll see there's only one question mark. And if you look on the left-hand side, he's probably not really asking a question there. That's what we call a non-genuine question. It's kind of like when a lawyer says, you were at the scene of the crime on Thursday the 2nd, weren't you? Kind of leading the witness. <laughs> um, and so he's, uh, he's not really asking a question to which he's opened the answer. He's asking a question for which he wants a specific answer. He's really making a statement. So he might mark that as a question, better than not asking a question, but not very much better. So um, that would give him a score of either zero or one um, for curiosity. In transparency, he'd be looking for things on the left that could be on the right. Doesn't mean he wants to move over the statement, what a hypocrite you are. That might not lead to a good <laughs> conversation. But he absolutely could say something like, um, boy, I'm seeing a real difference between what you're saying and what we're doing. I, I really don't understand that. Can you tell me more? That would combine some transparency with curiosity and would be productive. Challenging might make him feel dread, might be uh, difficult for him, but it would get to a better result almost certainly than the conversation we see. And the final one is uh, what kinds of things are triggers? Um, so for example, um, somebody saying, well, I can't leave this up to the team might be a trigger for Norbert. He might say, when I hear that, boy, it really gets my blood boiling and I really get frustrated. And that's when I flip the bozo bit and say, this is the end. Uh, I can't handle this anymore. Um, so if he can find those sorts of things, then he can pre-plan an action so that instead of going off the deep end, he can take a different action. Now, this reflection is really emotionally challenging. If we're here saying that you can make things better, uh, and but you can only make things better if you're willing to accept the fact that you want things to be different, and that, that means that you've been perhaps making mistakes if it's not getting the result that you wanted. If you wanted to build trust, in the case of Norbert here, but in, inside you're seething and you're not sharing what you uh, feel and you're not being very curious, and then you can say, look back and go, yeah, actually, I, I should have done better. Now, the good news is that you can start improving these skills if you can accept the sort of death of the ego. And and really, that understands like, yes, I made a mistake. That doesn't mean I'm a bad person. We're going to go ahead and, and move on to now what and show you what the, the third step is, the revise. And this is what a, a, a revised version of that same dialogue would look like. So this is Norbert doing the work. He's he's done the scoring as Squirrel described previously. What what kind of changes has Norbert made now in this revised dialogue? Which, by the way, is something he would write out. That's right. He doesn't he doesn't necessarily go and he didn't necessarily have the conversation again right away. He is he doing this work on paper? Mm -hmm. How did Norbert so, get to um, this? Yeah. Yeah, so what he did is he, he did the reflection we just talked about, and he said, boy, I'd like to be more curious. So you notice he now has two questions on the right-hand side, and each of them are at least an attempt at being more genuine. At least they don't directly contradict what's on the left-hand side. So he's not saying, I think the next step is only this one, and he's not saying um, we must talk about how we deal with uh, how we make decisions. So he's not presuming the answer. So this is movement. It's not perfect, I'm sure, but there are ways to be better. But it's certainly much uh, more curious. It's curiouser uh, than his previous dialogue. Um, he's taken into account the things that he'd like to share on the left-hand side. He's identified a trigger. And uh, he said, look, I'd like to share this information about autonomy and how it's very important for me that we increase autonomy. And that doesn't seem to be what Quinn is doing. 
And he does, in fact, share that in a constructive way on the right-hand side. He doesn't call Quinn a hypocrite. That's probably not going to help uh, him have a good dialogue with Quinn. But he does say, boy, this really doesn't work for me. I think we should talk about it. What do you think? Um, so he's improved in both those areas and used his trigger to identify a place where he could act differently. Now, of course, once you've written this, that doesn't mean you can do it live instantly. And uh, right after doing it, you can immediately behave differently. So that's where some practice can come in. That's both role-playing, as we're about to talk about, and um, uh, practicing uh, in, in further conversations to try out your, your new pre-planned actions. And you, you mentioned role play, and I think that's the point where a lot of times people have written something out, and then as they role play it, so in the case uh, here of Norbert, they would say, that they have a version and they say, well, I like the way it looked on paper, but actually I don't talk that way. That's something I, I often hear. We also talk about role reversal, which is maybe now I have you scroll to say back my own words to me. So, that so Norbert me would pretend to be Quinn story. and read it out to Jeffrey, right. who would then pretend to be Norbert. And then he could hear his own words coming back to him and say, oh, man, I'm over here is Quinn. Boy, that doesn't work as well. It sounded good when I said it. Didn't sound yeah. so good when I heard it. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's funny. It's funny how, how often that happens, that someone was very happy saying it, but didn't, didn't like hearing it. So those are the four steps. Uh, and these are the things you're going you're gonna to use these four steps to learn from any conversation you have. Now, you might learn, want to learn different things. In the book, we talk about the five conversations for building a high-performing team. And they are trust, fear, why, commitment, and accountability. Now, in each uh, type of conversation, we give you a different tool to use. And then that means that the reflect step, you essentially are working on a different type of skill. What we're going to do now, just in our remaining minutes, is take you a quick uh, run through how you would do this, particularly focusing on trust. So we've talked about transparency and curiosity, and we're going to stick with that theme. But now we're going to bring back the tool we talked about before. Um, Scroll, how would I be using uh, uh, the latter? How does it relate to uh, building trust? Well, it gives you both of those two elements of transparency and curiosity. And trust for us, we, we define a little differently than you might find it in the dictionary. When, when we talk about trust, what we mean and what we find is, is the, the real building block um, uh, for uh, a successful transformation is having a shared story. doesn't mean you have to agree about the story, but it has to be that my story matches close enough with Jeffrey's story that we can, we can marry them up. So for example, if my story is, Jeffrey is always trying to undermine me in these presentations. He always tries to grab the limelight. <laughs> He's only interested in uh, what he has to say, and he never gives me any space to talk. If that's my story, Jeffrey might share that story, which then we could have a very interesting conversation about, but it seems unlikely. He would probably have a story about um, perhaps how he has, uh, has to do more of the work and he has to develop the slides and, and other things like that. We're not going to have a great collaboration if our stories are that far apart. If our stories are closer together, they don't have to match, but they might be something like Squirrel knows less of the theory, Squirrel has um, um, uh, fewer things to say about some of these topics, and Jeffrey's going to carry more of the weight on the areas that he knows better. That would be a, a aligning of our stories would be more successful. There's no chance of us aligning our stories unless we share them. There's no chance of me getting closer to Jeffrey and moving in that direction so that we have a shared story that we can build that trust unless we go up the ladder together and Jeffrey understands how I got to the conclusion I got to, for example, that he's trying to grab the long night. I don't really believe this, by the way. I'm just picking up Jeffrey, <laughs> uh, which I like to do because he's my old friend. Um, but, but if I had that, then I'd want to share how I got there because interestingly, there might be some things that would contradict what I originally thought. And if I can share it and figure it out with Jeffrey, we can come to a shared story. Challenging, difficult, definitely helped by having a few pints sometimes, um, and more difficult <laughs> virtually, but tremendously valuable uh, once you summon the courage to do it and some of the skills. One, one thing you said that was very important in, in your example is you, you said, like, I need to understand how you got there. How, how did you come to think that I was hogging the limelight? I, I, I can ask you and learn about you know these different elements it doesn't mean that i agree and this is something that i think people often get stuck up on if they if i think that you're wrong about it that's a lot of times i, I lose my curiosity you know why, how could you how could you believe that that belief doesn't make any sense and i'm no longer curious this is not about everyone becoming you know mind melding and having the same view of the world it's really about having uh, now a shared understanding like i oh i understand how squirrel got to that he had, he had some data he was picking up. He made some assumptions. They're not ones that I made. They, I, don't, I don't think they're correct. But I at least understand Squirrel's story. That's, see, that, that's the, what we're aiming for here. 
I can have trust if I understand his story and why he's acting the way he is, as opposed to just making up my own story. Now, there's another way to use the latter, though, Squirrel, your, your favorite way, and this is the one we alluded to in the, as in the previous slide. We talked about TDD for, for people. Uh, uh, can you talk us about how you use this? I know this is one of your favorite tools. It absolutely is. So um, some of our audience will be familiar with test-driven development. Some of them will not, so I won't be too technical here. Um, but um, those of you who are might pick up some, some elements that are similar to this development coding tool called test-driven development. The idea is that um, you use the latter as a method of um, uh, discovering new information. So this is a way of being curious, as well as, uh, to some extent, being transparent. So uh, what I do is I imagine that each step I'm going to take on the ladder is like a test. And I'm going to say it's green if I kind of understood the reasoning, if I got to where I expected to be, if I understood. And our stories are aligned to that point. And if it's red, that means I discovered something new. Just like in, in testing, discovering something new that was wrong in your system is good. It's like, hallelujah, this didn't get to live, right? Hallelujah, we didn't erase everybody's hard drive thanks to releasing the wrong configuration. We tested and we found it out. Good for us. So uh, red is good in the sense that it tells you uh, some new information that's helpful. So um, Jeffrey, can can we do one of these? I think it might be helpful for everybody sure. if we uh, if we test Absolutely. it. Cool. And uh, do you want to be the uh, the tester or the testee? Do you want me to be uh, describing and questioning you, or uh, the other way around? Uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be questioning you. Okay, that sounds fantastic. So Jeffrey's okay. going to um, ask me some questions. He's going to kind of walk up the ladder of inference. Doesn't matter whether he hits every rung. That's not the important thing. But he's going to discover new things as he goes. And I predicted at some point he's going to fall off the ladder. Our stories are not going to be the same about the topic that uh, that Jeffrey's going to bring up with me. So go ahead, Jeffrey, and uh, I'll see if I can uh, give you some new information along the way. Sure. So Squirrel, I, you and I were giving this presentation uh, that we're giving right now. And, and earlier, uh, you spoke over me as I was trying to talk. Did you notice that? Yeah, I definitely did. Okay, okay, good. And now, um, now the, the assumption I was making is that you're doing this on purpose, that you know, maybe you uh, felt like I was gonna say something uh, not quite right and you were uh, preempting me. Was that the case? Uh, well, it's not that you weren't gonna say something right. It was just that I thought there was a good place to interject there and I thought you'd paused, but I turned out I wasn't right. You hadn't paused. So I wound up talking over you. Oh, okay. So I, so I had gotten the idea that you were doing this, uh, that you intentionally, but now you're saying that that wasn't intentional. No, I think it's just that there's a little bit of a lag between us. And so uh, I see you talking a few moments after you actually start talking. So I thought you'd stopped, but you hadn't. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I, I, I guess I, I guess I learned that. Well, thanks, thanks for letting me know. And you can imagine how Jeffrey's ladder might have continued up to Squirrel is trying to hog the limelight and get in my way and interrupt me <laughs> and so on. I don't know if that's where you were going or not, but um, there might have been many rungs of the ladder. He might come up to an action like um, you know yelling at Squirrel or, or uh, telling Squirrel he can't be on any calls anymore or something like that. And that would have all been founded on the information because he was assuming in this situation that, uh, that I was intentionally talking over him, whereas in fact, that was the last thing I wanted to do. And he's discovered new information that changes his point of view and allows us to bring our stories closer together. For example, we could get me better internet so that we wouldn't be laggy so much, and then we wouldn't have this problem. And that would be a much better solution than saying, um, you know, hey, let's uh, let's not do talks together anymore. And, and finding out that those misunderstandings and coming up to, to joint design really gives that, that improved trust, better leadership. It, these are the, these are the things that when you say, how do we get um, and change our culture? It, changing your conversations the way we just described are the way to do it. And uh, if you want to know more about uh, four R's, as we said, we've we've given you the, the recap here. You can do this with many different models. We also have a, a podcast episode dedicated just to this. You can find that from uh, our website on Troubleshooting Agile Podcast. And um, there's plenty more material behind this that we've picked this up from uh, the larger business community, in particular, someone named Chris Ardris and the domain of action science. And if you want a short one, uh, by the way, because I, I know people are, are um, pressed for time. They like short things. Some of these are long books or old books you have to order and get out of print. Um, eight Behaviors for Smarter Teams. If you just type that into Google, you'll find about an eight-page document um, from uh, Schwartz, who's one of the followers of Argyris. And uh, that's one of my favorites because it's brief, freely available, and summarizes a lot of the ideas very nicely. So if you're looking for something short, that's where to start.
And of course, uh, what we can now say for the first time in, the, in, the, in the, only the past month, you can now say, of course, Agile Conversations will take you through this. And uh, there's a lot more. Uh, at, uh, if you have any questions for us, you can get in touch with us at conversationaltransformation.com. Absolutely. And I should mention, by the way, we also have some online training, which is coming up on Friday, the 3rd of July. So if you're interested in signing up for that, it's the resources link at conversationaltransformation.com, along with lots of uh, free material like uh, videos and uh, pamphlets and um, uh, materials that you can read and uh, that you can get for free as well to, to reinforce some of these ideas. Awesome. Thank you so much, Douglas and Jeffrey, for an engaging and entertaining conversation. Um, and thank you to all of our knowledgeable speakers and panelists for joining us today and sharing all their insights on the IT industry and where it's going today, especially in this remote culture we're working in today.